then, you know, first give a very brief introduction. This is going to be a very basic uh, overview of kidney cancer, and then we'll get into more details. So here is a picture of the kidney, and, you know, the important thing to point out is that um, this is the renal cortex, the one on this side, and this is where kidney cancer happens. But you can see that there are other malignancies that can happen in the kidney too. So I put in a renal pelvis is a urothelial cancer. So that's very confusing to a lot of patients where they actually have a bladder type of lining. So in the center is where um, urine is made. So as I point out here, this is called the renal pelvis, and this is where urine is made. It comes down the urine tube called the ureter, which is then connected to the bladder. So you can get, a, a, the, when there's cancer in this lining, it's typically more a urinary type of cancer. And again, the kidney is removed for it, but it's not really kidney cancer. So true kidney cancers that we are going to be spending time talking about today are those cancers that occur here in the cortex. Then there are other type of tumors that can happen in the kidney too. There is lymphomas, there are sarcomas, but our group today, we are going to focus on true kidney cancers. So what's the uh, incidence? So this is, uh, this is the uh, 2013 estimate of new cancers, both in men and women. And as you can see, kidney cancer features, it's not very common, so compared to cancers like prostate and breast cancer, which affects 250,000 people per year, kidney cancer affects about 45,000 people per year, but it still features as the top cancer in men and in women. The second half is what are the deaths that happen from kidney cancer, and unfortunately, kidney cancer features as the top 10 causes of death from cancer in men, and so there remains a lot of work to be done in trying to improve that. So what about um, kidney cancer at diagnosis? We'll talk a little bit about the staging of kidney cancer, but overall, about 50% of patients at diagnosis will have their disease confined to the kidney. So we call that localized disease and a quarter of patients present with locally advanced disease. So that could involve um, the tumor involving the um, renal vein, the blood vessel, surrounding uh, fat, and finally a third present with metastatic disease, meaning that the disease has left the kidney and has spread elsewhere. So this is not uncommon and it's very classic where patients go in for completely another reason altogether. So you go in for abdominal pain, you get a CT, and they find a tumor in the kidney. Fortunately, those are localized again, so that represents this group of patients. But there are patients who go in for to the emergency room for a cough, and they find spots in the lung, and that then leads to a CT scan where you then find a kidney tumor. So even today, a third of patients at diagnosis already have disease that spread elsewhere, and that's metastatic disease. So here is the TNM staging. So this is important just to keep in mind. Every cancer, it's not just specific to kidney, but this is true for every cancer that we deal with. Once a diagnosis is made, you want to know what's the stage. And this TNM basically stands, T stands for tumor, N stands for node, and M stands for metastasis. And you pick one from each of this, and it will give you a stage in numbers as either one, two, three, or four. So let me just walk you through the stage. So stage one, T1 tumors are those that are, lim that are less than seven centimeters in size. And you know, seven seems like a big number, but for kidney cancer, it's still considered stage one. If you were to have a tumor that's less than seven centimeters and all confined to the kidney would be a stage one. So that's T1, 
there is no lymph nodes and there is no metastasis and that's stage one. Stage two would be if tumors are greater than seven centimeters, but they are still confined to the kidneys. So that makes it a T2. Again, no lymph nodes, no metastasis, and that makes it a stage two. Stage three tumors, on the other hand, could be whatever size. It could be a six centimeter tumor, but if it has involvement of lymph nodes, that becomes a stage three. If it involves the blood vessel, such as the renal vein, or the big blood vessel called inferior vena cava, that makes it a stage three. And then finally, stage four could be any size, but if there are metastases such as disease in the lung, that becomes an M1, and it automatically makes it a stage four. Now, how about the classification of kidney cancer? We know that all tumors, we need to look at it under the microscope, and that's what the pathologist tells us as to what type of kidney cancer it is. And I want to say here that today, we treat all kidney cancers alike, but that just goes to show how rudimentary we are in our staging, and things are improving where we are now able to know that kidney cancer is not the same. There are different types of kidney cancer, and the most common one on, when, it, when we look at it under the microscope is called clear cell kidney cancer. That's what happens in 75% of kidney cancers that are removed are of the clear cell type. Then there are other less common categories. The second most common one is called papillary. And typically, you'll hear pathologists and you'll hear uh, physicians lump them together as clear cell or non-clear cell. And the non-clear cell includes these subtypes. They include papillary. And we have two types of papillary today, papillary type 1 and papillary type 2. Mm -hmm. And then there are less common types called chromophobe or oncocytoma. Why do these matter? Because we know that these different types are driven by different type of mutation. So we know that the biology of the disease is not all uniform, and papillary type Clear cell type of kidney cancer is driven by the von Hippel-Lindau mutation, and I'm going to talk about that in my next slide. And then papillary is driven mo more by this mutation called CMET. And the point that I want to make for you to take from this slide is that there are different drugs that are in development that are coming along for different cell types. So in the future, we hope that we will be able to do different analysis on tumors that tells us exactly what is driving an individual's tumor so that we can target drugs individually and not use this broad one drug fits all as we do today. So this, a little bit of background. So again, you know, um, kidney cancer typically, again, 75% are clear cell. Prior to 2005, we call it the uh, pre-targeted era, where the most common treatment used to be uh, interferon or immunotherapy, including interleukin-2. And then starting in 2005, just our understanding about the biology of this disease led to a variety of drugs, which we'll touch upon in the next uh, several hours today, that led to seven approved drugs for kidney cancer in the span of about eight years. And I think that uh, list hopefully will continue. And I think till we have patients cured from this disease, till we have patients who remain without any evidence of disease, the search will continue for new drugs. So here is the progress that has been made in kidney cancer in terms of drug therapy. So in 1992 was when high-dose interleukin-2 was approved. And I'm going to show you a little bit uh, on subsequent slides about what the effectiveness of this drug is. But typically, interleukin-2 was approved in 1992. 
and has not been widely used because it's not uh, the right drug for every patient, but it's certainly been around and we have learned how to use that drug well. And then starting in 2005, you can see that we have had a variety of new drugs. The first approved targeted drug which affects the VEGF pathway was serafinib. And then in 2006, we had a drug called sunitinib that was approved. In 2007, there was a drug called Temsirolimus, which is a new class of drugs called mTOR inhibitors. And then in 2008, there was an intravenous drug called Bevacizumab or Avastin, which was approved for kidney cancer in combination with interferon. And then 2009, there was an oral mTOR inhibitor called Everolimus and 2010, pazopinib, and in 2012, axitinib. So it's a great way to have all these drugs uh, available to patients. And I think one of the things that's um, remarkable in kidney cancer is that a given patient could get benefit from all of these drugs at various stages of their disease. So I think that's perhaps the most uh, encouraging uh, news, that having these seven drugs that that we hope that every patient gets benefit from each of these drugs when they need it. So here is just a brief background about the science behind all of this drug development. So the key in kidney cancer is this protein called VHL. So patients who have an hereditary or a familial uh, acquiring of this VHL abnormality are predisposed to developing kidney cancer. And they have not just, so if you have this VHL syndrome, you not only get kidney cancers, but you also have other cancers such as tumors of the brain, um, there are liver tumors that happen with it. So the VHL syndrome is an abnormality of this VHL gene, and people who have that have predilection for kidney cancers and variety of other cancers too. But what we have learned is that even people who don't have this genetic predisposition in regular kidney cancers, this VHL protein is abnormal and it's mutated. So what happens when you have this abnormal mutation? So here on the left is what normally happens to VHL. So here is the v normal VHL protein. It combines with this protein called hydroxyproline, it's an amino acid, and it binds to this HIF1-alpha. And then after that binding happens, it normally gets broken down by this ubiquitin and it gets degraded. That's the normal process that happens. Now, if you have an abnormal VHL, as happens in kidney cancer, you can see that this binding does not happen, okay? So this HIF1-alpha just accumulates and it cannot get broken down. And so there is an accumulation of this HIF1. And the consequence of increase in HIF1 are all these uh, in, uh, hypoxia-inducible genes such as VEGF, PDGF. So it was really this discovery that led to drugs that people started wondering, okay, if there are drugs that can block VEGF, can we then um, make a difference in kidney cancer? If there are drugs that block this PDGF, would that make a difference? So really, it was understanding this pathway that led to the development of all of these new drugs. So here is an example of the VEGF pathway, which we now know in kidney cancer is really the key in some of the drugs that we use. So this VEGF is called the ligand, and it can be blocked in many different ways, okay? There are antibodies that can uh, prevent this binding. So that's what a Vastin is. It's an anti-VEGF antibody. Or you can just prevent this, this, the, this VEGF is the ligand. It has to bind to this receptor called VEGFR. And once that binding happens, the tumor then can uh, proliferate and can grow. So you can prevent this either by an antibody up here, 
or you can prevent this VEGF from binding to the receptor, and that's what these small drugs such as sunitinib, sorafenib, and other drugs do. So that's the VEGF inhibitors. And you can see up here we have drugs such as sunitinib, sorafenib, axitinib, and pazopinib, all working by blocking this VEGF inhibitor. And then we also have the other class of drugs which are called mTOR inhibitors. And you can see they all complexly interact with each other. And we have two drugs, Everolimus and Temsirolimus. So in summary then, the medical therapy for kidney cancer in 2014 really includes three classes of drugs. You have immunotherapy, which includes interleukin-2 and interferon. And you'll hear as the day goes by that we are hopeful for the future that this list is going to be expanding and there are many new drugs in development and very close to coming to patient care in the future. And then these are the VEGF inhibitors. They include sunitinib, sorafenib, pazopinib, and axitinib, and bevacizumab, which is the intravenous form. And then the third class of drugs are the mTOR inhibitors, everolimus and temsirolimus. So this is a brief overview just so that you're introduced to what you're going to hear in the uh, day today. So with that, I'm just going to share with you the agenda for today. I've just done my little welcome spiel. Um, unfortunately, uh, the next person, which is the CEO of Kidney Cancer Association, he couldn't be here today, but he shared a slide, which I'll show you in a minute. And then um, I'm going to then give you again, um, maybe I see Ben up here, just for um, the chronology of things, it might be a good idea for Dr. Chung to talk a little bit on local therapy because that's what really happens. You have tumors confined to the kidney and we want to talk about the surgical management. And then I'll come back and talk about the medical treatment just to give you an overview of each of these drugs and some of the important questions that we have learned over the last decade with all of these new drugs. Then we are going to um, have Dr. Harstack so she's a medical oncologist who's now at uh, Kaiser. She's going to come and talk to us about uh, immunotherapy, and I think that's really a, a, the most exciting area in the last year that we have learned about some of the new drugs. So she's going to give us an update. And then I'm hoping that Dr. Louis, John Louis, he's on call today, but he said he would come by. So we may have to have some flexibility in the agenda today. So he's going to come and he's a radiologist here at Stanford. He's going to um, show us some of the novel ways by which radiologists are able to do local therapy and he's going to use liver directed therapy as an example for how radiologists can help us treat some of these tumors that you don't need a full systemic treatment but may be confined just to the liver. We are then going to have some time for panel discussion. Again, as I said, uh, this meeting is for you, so I really want to encourage all of you to participate and feel that your questions have been answered, so that's a good time for uh, discussion. We are gonna break out for lunch. And during lunch, we are going to have one of our social workers. Her name is uh, Jordan Chavez who's going to help all of us interact and perhaps if you feel comfortable telling your story so that the rest of uh, us can um, hear about it. Jordan is going to help facilitate that at lunch. And then in the uh, afternoon, we are going to have Dr. Leppert, who's one of our urologists. He's participated in this conference many times as well. He's going to talk about some fluorescein imaging that he is engaged with. We are then going to have, again, an overview from one of our radiologists in nuclear medicine, Dr. Eric Mitra, who's going to just give us what is done for imaging, how best can we look at different scans for kidney cancer, and how best uh, imaging is done. One of our junior colleagues, her name is Alice Fan. She's a medical oncologist who works with us here. She's going to come in the afternoon and talk about 
how do we know that the treatment that you're getting is working? So she is engaged in some very novel ways in which we can help determine those for, um, tr for our patients. And finally, we'll hear about um, the side effects from some of these drugs and how best to manage those side effects. So we have invited Melissa Viatori. She used to be a nurse practitioner here at Stanford who's now at UCSF. So she's going to come in the afternoon and help uh, give us a talk. And with that, we'll close the day. So we have a very good agenda for you. And again, um, I want to thank all of you for coming here and um, sharing your day with us today.